thank you for visiting us, Dr. Castro. We really appreciate the time. Um, we'd love if you just offer us a little bit of introduction to yourself and your work and where you come from. Sure. Um, thanks, Jonathan. So um, I uh, teach at Johns Hopkins, um, both in our Berman Institute of Bioethics and um, in our School of Public Health. Um, the way that our Bioethics Institute is organized, um, we have faculty from Public Health, Medicine, Nursing, and the Department of Philosophy and Arts and Sciences. Um, my own background is um, uh, doctoral training in public health and research methods where I developed a very strong interest in ethics and then I did a postdoctoral fellowship in ethics at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown and then have been on the faculty at Johns Hopkins um, ever since. We didn't have a Berman Institute of Bioethics then, that's about 15 years old, but um, we're fortunate that that's grown considerably and we now have 35 faculty affiliated with it and a doctoral program and um, you know the kinds of things that happen anywhere of research and teaching and enjoying talking to each other um, and collaborating. My own work is, um, I, I, I like most people, I'm interested in a lot of things, but I guess I would say that um, the two uh, primary categories are public health ethics. Um, I've been doing some work recently related to ethics and obesity prevention and what are the ethics trade-offs for different kinds of strategies related to obesity prevention um, and research ethics. And there's um, lots of subtopics in research ethics, but I've enjoyed doing that for a while. That sounds like a fantastically interesting space. Thank you. Part of the reason we invited you to campus was to teach us a little bit and talk with us a little bit about international research ethics. Um, so just generally speaking, what do you see as the sort of core or key ethical issues in international research ethics? Uh, it's hard to pinpoint what the key issues are in international research ethics, but I think that the hardest issues in international research ethics stem from the injustices that exist around the world and the special ethics uh, challenges that arise when research is being conducted in environments where uh, there just aren't enough resources. And so um, particularly if one thinks of the context where a researcher from a wealthier context like the United States or Western Europe goes to, a, uh, to an environment or a country that has fewer resources like in Africa or South Asia or South America, um, often what the researcher is trying to do is figure out ways to make a bad situation a little bit better when everybody knows that the bad situation could be made a lot better with interventions we already have, like clean water or getting everybody uh, access to any reasonable kind of health care. So there are issues that emerge because everybody's trying to figure out whether it really is okay to uh, try something like bed nets or oral rehydration when really the answer that should be in place is clean water or a, a whole different approach. We don't have malaria in the United States. So um, there are issues that come up around what can be provided during trials, what needs to be owed to people after trials. There's a lot of other issues as well, but I think the ones that become the most vexing are the justice ones because everybody can look at the situation and figure out a way to make the situation considerably better. Um, and the question is, but in the meantime, when nobody's making the situation considerably better, should we let the research go in and make it conceivably a little bit better? Or do we not become sort of complicit with this idea that a little bit better is ethically acceptable and hold out for the, the, the mother load big time solution? Um, so to me, there are a lot of questions that emerge in that space, but that's the source of it. And that the questions of justice aren't just exclusive to international settings, too. So we could think about them in terms of any famous case here in the US, even Tuskegee is a great example, um, where some of the things you said in, about international context seem to apply domestically as well. So a further question, a follow-up question might be something like, are these issues of justice somehow unique to international research ethics, or is it just a, a different or broader application of the same sort of ethical content? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, they are not unique, but I think they're far more prevalent. So there are certain kinds of, so we obviously have um, extraordinary inequities in the United States. And yet, it still is true that a researcher could go into a neighborhood 
identify um, some health problem that somebody they interact with has and find a place where they can refer them that usually is not that far away and will treat people who don't have much money. And I don't mean to suggest or paint an inappropriate picture that care at Axis in the United States is great, but the researcher usually doesn't have to worry about to what extent am I personally going to take responsibility for providing them all the health care they need. Whereas researchers in international settings often do have to confront that question. When somebody comes in, w whether they have a, some kind of funny adverse event from the research itself or they just start coming to the researcher who's the only trained healthcare practitioner for 100 miles and says, can you treat the infection on my foot? Can you treat my child's diarrhea when it's some HIV study of a pregnant woman? But those are issues that experienced researchers talk about a lot and I think those kinds of things happen more. Mm -hmm. um, over lunch today, you spoke a little bit about the distinction between clinical research and clinical practice and uh, sort of orientations towards treatments. Could you tell us a little bit more about, generally speaking, what you find important or interesting about that distinction? Yeah. So um, I've been thinking about research ethics for a while and, and believe deeply in the importance of uh, protecting people from what could be the harms of dangerous research and we never want to harm someone for the sake of we don't we never want to harm someone in some deep and permanent and significant way for the sake of um, helping someone else in the future that's that's a kind of um, ethics pact that we make with the public and I think it's really important it turns out that the um, ethics infrastructure that we've put in place in the United States with IRBs and other kinds of of oversight tends to lump all research into one category. There are some gradations, but essentially anything that's going to be called research with a particular definition needs to get some kind of oversight. And anything that's not called research doesn't need to get any kind of ethics oversight. And the more we start to peel back the layers, the more we recognize that some research is the kind we need to proceed very slowly with give it a lot of oversight, modify the methods, have long discussions with the patients or, or participants. Um, but other kinds of research is more straightforward. And similarly, there is, we're learning an extraordinary amount of clinical practice that um, is not sufficiently informed by evidence where more and more people are thinking if we could uh, do a lot more research, much of which is a very low risk kind of research, we could improve the quality of clinical care very quickly. So my interest in doing that work with my colleagues, Ruth Faden and others, was in starting to look at the space where um, research and practice overlap more, where the kinds of things we want to learn more about in care are the kinds of treatments we've been giving to people for a long time, um, things that some people call quality improvement, which is another language for systematically collecting data to improve care for future patients and start to figure out how we can uphold all of our long-standing and important commitments to providing people with the best care possible, never exploiting them or harming them for the sake of others, but allowing the learning to proceed in a more efficient way. Mm, makes a lot of sense. So the things you're targeting in collapsing that distinction tend to be lower risk things with higher potential benefits. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, again, to reiterate part of the reason we invited you to campus to speak about international issues, um, so we're aware of and excited about your work with uh, the John Hopkins Fogarty African Bioethics Training Program funded by the National Institutes of Health. Um, can you summarize a little bit of that work for us and sort of where the origins of that work came from? Sure. So um, the Fogarty International Center is a very small piece of the NIH that most people don't hear about. Um, and they invest their funds almost exclusively in the buzzword now is capacity development, but training in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, for international partners from low and middle income countries who uh, want to be and ought to be better trained to be better partners in whatever research the NIH is already funding globally. So historically, Fogarty funded epidemiologists and vaccinologists and lab scientists, 
um, train people to get a master's of public health degree so that those people could be better partners in the research and it wasn't just American researchers going somewhere doing research and coming back, which was a model that nobody thought was right. In the year 2000, 14 years ago, the Fogarty International Center realized that it needed to expand its program. And that was the year that Jerry Kirsch, their director, said um, bioethics was one of the um, handful of areas um, they were going to um, enter. And so they put out a call for applications for the first time for uh, institutions that wanted to do some kind of training in bioethics, but specifically focusing on research ethics. Um, our program at Johns Hopkins um, was funded then, so we've been fortunate to have a program that's now in its 14th year. We focus on the African continent, and our program initially started with what I call a graduate school model, which is we had individuals apply as individuals who wanted this training. Okay. We provided them with training. They went back to where they were and went about their careers. And this was um, from all over the continent? From all over Africa. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Our program is in English, so someone from Francophone Africa had to be fluent in English. Um, but anyone could apply, and we had people from, uh, I want to say, 28. No, we had 28 trainees from 13 countries, I think is, is right. Um, it's a relatively small budget. We could only, we trained three people a year. Um, and on the one hand, the program was great and really successful. Um, but on the other hand, uh, bioethics is even a newer field in Africa than it is here, and we know how hard it is to find a position in bioethics here. And we were finding that while some of our trainees were really successful, they, they were often having to do bioethics at night, they weren't going back to real positions, they had other jobs they had to return to, and some of them were, and their training was sort of being lost by the wayside. Um, and so we switched our model four years ago to be an institutional partnership model where an institution as a whole would apply. They already had to have some people with some kind of training in bioethics and commitment from the highest levels that they wanted to develop a bioethics program. So we moved into doing that and now have a commitment to work with three African um, universities, the University of Botswana, the University of Zambia, and Makeri University in Uganda. And it's still a model where a few of their people come each year to us for training, but we do a lot more um, going there, interacting, strategic planning. Think, you know, think about if you wanted to form a new department of something, that's part of what we're doing and helping with some of the logistics side as well as the substantive ethics side. Sounds fantastic. Uh, here at Penn State, we have a relatively young but growing very quickly bioethics program um, young scholars are coming from across the university really interested in joining us. Uh, if you could offer one piece of advice to young students looking to intersect with bioethics at some level, what would that piece of advice be? So do you mean for the students who are doing science, what, how should they think about ethics for, or for people who want to start having a career in bioethics specifically? I think we've got um, a joint PhD program here, so we've got joint students from anthropology and from nursing and from sociology maybe, some other fields. So these are folks who will likely have future careers or professional lives that, have, that intersect with bioethics, mm -hmm. that may be in bioethics departments, or maybe just bioethical components to work in other right. fields. So they are scientists. Let's stick with that yeah. invitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's another great question. Well, um, it's hard to think of one piece of advice. I mean, it, it, without sounding totally corny, which is um, do what you like to do find really great people to work with. I mean, that's a style thing. I work collaboratively, so for me, I feel like my work is better and my life is happier if I find great people to work with who are um, really smart and sometimes who come from a different disciplinary background and together we make a better project than if I had done it, um, done it alone. Um, I, I think people in bioethics, and particularly the kind of students you're training, become really bridge people and it may be that the anthropologist is the only person in her future department with some kind of training in bioethics and she can really think creatively about how to best think about bioeth bioethics and anthropology and she can bring that kind of social science ethnographic perspective to a conversation with everybody else. So I, I would say to people, um, treat that bridge identity as a real strength and when they interview for jobs, talk about it and when they think about the roles they would have in teaching and advising and interdisciplinary work, um, exploited in the best sense. So I know a lot of people get anxious about um, mixing disciplines and 
um, I understand that, but I also think there can be some real advantages. Thank you very much, Dr. Kess. It's a pleasure to speak with you. It's a pleasure to speak with you and to be here. You have a great program. It's great to see it um, in action and growing the way it is. Thank you so much. You're welcome.